if you look at the cohort of students in the UK, 93% of those will be state school educated, um, but a very minor number of those will go on to securing the university places at places like Cambridge or Oxford. Um, and the whole idea is just to inspire those students to try and defy that kind of typical state school um, statistic of those not getting into universities as frequently as necessarily people that are privately educated. It's my great pleasure to have here Gemma Penson with us, who has just finished the first year of her undergraduate degree in the computer science tripos here at Cambridge. And she's been my student, but I've, I'm meeting her for the first time uh, because I have only been lecturing indirectly through uh, recorded videos. So it's the first time I have the pleasure of meeting you, Gemma. So nice to meet you. Uh, can you please tell us something about you. yourself or what you what you like, uh, what you're up to and what are your interests? Yeah, so hi everyone. Um, I'm Gemma. I'm a first year computer science student um, here at the University of Cambridge. Um, I attend Trinity Hall College. Um, my kind of general interests at the moment are mostly AI and machine learning and I'm currently pursuing um, a couple of internships that are kind of focused around that. Mm, that's, uh, that's great and um, you um, seem to be very switched on. How did you first get into computers? What got you into that stuff? And uh, maybe how old were you when you first wrote a computer program? I don't think I necessarily have the kind of traditional considered journey into computer science. I kind of very much fell into it by chance. Um, I was initially pursuing theatre, wanting to um, go into kind of a technical role in that or alternatively just acting itself. I wasn't quite sure yet, but I knew it had to be something in a theatre. So I tailored my GCSE choices towards that. But it ended up being that my options that I picked weren't accessible to me just because of a timetable clash. So I was left with an empty slot I had to fill. So I went around to all the different departments and tried to work out roughly what I wanted to fill with it. And I ended up going with computer science as my fourth subject, just as something that I thought I might try. It was kind of related to what I wanted and the teacher seemed really enthusiastic. And it kind of just went from there. Um, I really enjoyed the course. I didn't realize how much I'd enjoy it. And I found myself exploring it more in my free time which then kind of spiraled into it becoming my future career prospectus rather than just a full subject that I took on the side, which was really exciting to see myself get into something that I didn't necessarily think I would enjoy before. That's cool. So so something in your basically final year of school made you think of that. Hey, what, what's the thing that made it, made it click? What's the thing that said, well, now and at the university, I'm going to do computer science as opposed to all the other things? I don't think that was necessarily kind of a click moment. It was very much a gradual process. Um, I very much explored my options carefully and didn't dive straight into one narrow path. Um, but I tailored my kind of A-level options around computer science and mathematics. Again, I wasn't sure which one I wanted to go into, so I kind of did both. Um, and then from there, I kind of worked out whether I wanted to go into pure mathematics or something more applied like computer science. Um, and I did that through kind of general access work and looking at work online and watching YouTube and just getting a general kind of overview of the subject through my personal time. And from that, I then realized that like, yes, I'd much rather pursue something that's a little bit more applied like computer science than go into something that's a bit more purely mathematical. Well, you, you, you have a maturity that I rarely uh, find in people your age about planning ahead. Uh, do you have a clue what you want to do with this computer science degree once you finish your tripos? Um, I think I had a rough idea. I initially thought I wanted to go into programming. I think if I've learned anything from this year that I have changed my mind and that's not what I want to necessarily go into. I think my main thing at the moment is just trying to be open and broad about the subjects that I'm studying. From my first year, I've personally found that I have studied subjects I never would have even considered to be actual computer science subjects, such as stuff like interactive design, where it's very psychology based. I wouldn't have necessarily considered those as actual units that people could study within the field. So I think at the moment, I'm just really looking forward to trying to work out what the actual industry looks like, what the kind of different jobs are, so that I can then work out roughly what I want to go in from there. But I think if I had to say here and now, it will probably be something to do with AI, machine learning, 
um, a kind of like user research kind of role. But yeah, as I say, I'm very much trying to keep my options open and just explore my subject as much as I can at the moment. So what what what's attractive about AI and machine learning? Everybody seems to want to be doing that these days. <laughs> That's true. Um, I just really like how up and coming it is. It's very um, useful. Obviously, it's a great thing to have in the field. Um, there's so many kind of medical um, kind of implications that it has, which is something that I've looked into quite a lot. Um, but it just seems to be a really great area. And for me personally, as someone who isn't necessarily keen on a purely programming role, there's a lot of AI machine learning roles that look at data analytics and research um, and interacting with clients from a kind of psychology and research end, um, which I think would be a really great role for myself, which will have some programming aspects, but not in programming entirely, like something like software development, um, which I know is something that I don't necessarily want to pursue at the moment. So you, you said earlier you, uh, you went in thinking that you would be doing programming, that you would uh, like to do that, and then you discovered other things and they were more enjoyable than programming? Yeah, I found that I had more of an enthusiasm to pursue those things wider than I did necessarily with my programming. So is the interaction design you mentioned, which you didn't expect to find, the most exciting thing you've done in your first year? Um, I would say it was one of the more interesting courses. Um, I think my favorite was probably graphics, just because it was so abstract in terms of we dealt with color spaces, we learned about how color works, how shading and lighting um, works from a physics perspective. I think it was a really great course all round from giving us a really great wide perspective of different subjects all intertwined into one. Um, and I know there's a further graphics course in my second year, which I'm quite looking forward to doing. Um, the machine learning was also a great one. Um, we unfortunately did have obviously, the thing that we were all online. We were working from home at that point. So it definitely wasn't the experience that we probably would have had in the labs necessarily in a normal year, um, which I think impacted our ability to enjoy the course a little bit. But I think the actual like pure content itself was again, really interesting. Um, we were looking at movie databases and how we could work out what um, predictions in terms of what um, star rankings that films would get and we also looked at some natural language stuff um, looking at how we can process those reviews and look at how sentences are structured in a way that are sometimes not very intuitive at all like words like don't and not get put into there and they're very hard to dissect in terms of working out whether a word is positive or negative and it's just stuff like that the kind of like little nitpicks of the actual processes rather than the processes themselves i found really interesting because they were things that i wouldn't have necessarily even thought about if someone was like okay you're gonna complete this process, things such as working out the actual nuances of language were things that I hadn't necessarily considered, but really enjoyed learning about. Good, good. So, um, one of the reasons uh, I'm, I'm pleased to have you here is because uh, we have uh, fewer, many fewer uh, women than men in computer science, as everyone uh, immediately notices. Uh, and it is not because we select men in preference to women when we admit. I'm an, an admissions officer. And the problem is that among the applicants, there's maybe uh, one woman in 10. And so it's hard to get to a balanced selection after that. So it's before people even apply that we should uh, do something about it. So we are speaking to teenagers who might consider what to do. Uh, and if you speak to someone like you a few years ago, um, who might not have thought of going to university. Uh, first of all, do you have a clue why uh, women, young women are less uh, likely to apply to university or to Cambridge in particular? Uh, and second, uh, what do you have to say to them? I think it's very much an issue with stereotype. Um, a lot of people will see the stereotype and then kind of get a feeling that they don't necessarily belong in such an industry. And there's also not that many female role models in terms of ones that are prominent and well-known. There's people like Ada Lovelace and whatnot, but not any kind of very recent up and coming computer scientists that are very at the front of the kind of media. There's loads out there, there is so many. The issue is their publicity isn't where it needs to be, unfortunately. I feel it's really an issue that kind of stems quite far back in someone's education necessarily, because if you want to necessarily get into computer science, a lot of people will consider it at GCSE level or A level or look around the subject before they then get to the degree level where they're committing a fair amount of time, effort and money to an actual subject. So I personally found that in my GCSE computer science class, there was um, three females in the class. And then when I got to A level, I was the only um, female identifying student in the class which was quite a shock to me considering 
I thought that it may have been improved by that point, but it was very much the case that there was that kind of segregation of the fact that there was only one female. Um, I think a lot of people, when they try and address it, don't necessarily do it in the best way. A lot of people will make it quite awkward or like, oh, I need to do something specifically because of your gender. Um, I think it needs to be an open conversation, but one where it's a lot more inclusive, where everyone is inclusive, included rather than just specifically focusing on improving the access of one gender necessarily, because then it, again, it can create that kind of isolation feeling that, oh, I'm in this subject just because I'm female or I'm getting this opportunity just because of my gender. It needs to have a balance between having those access in place where those students who are female identifying are able to explore their subject in a safe way, in a way that they feel that they are empowered in their industry. But at the same time, it doesn't need to be such a kind of nuance that it's only applicable to those members of the community because fundamentally it's about what skill sets you have what you can bring to the industry and fundamentally if um, we want to get to the point where it is an inclusive industry we in a way need to consider gender away from the subject so that we're just purely focusing on ability rather than any kind of nuances in terms of what the person is individually I'm, I'm very very happy to hear you say that and I I resonate entirely with this. The thing that I don't like is when people say, well, you know, we should bring a balance of genders and therefore there should be a quota of, you know, that many mm. should get in just because they are female, which I find, I mean, if I were female, I would find it offensive. I'm there mm -hmm. because I'm good, but because I'm female. Uh, yeah. It's it's kind of demeaning. And I don't think it should be like that at all. And I'm, I'm glad you sound like you agree. I think what should happen is that everyone regardless of what they look like, what their gender is, what their skin color is, and so on and so on, uh, should have equal opportunity to get in. And then we'll select the best. But we want everybody to be equally represented in the ones who have a chance to get in. And there is some kind of pre-selection that happens, maybe self-selection that says, oh, I'm not good enough for that because all of them look like that. All of them look like boys. So I'm not a boy. I'm not, I shouldn't be applying. And I don't, I, that's what I want to fight. But I, I don't want to have a quota of females or a quota of blacks or a quota of anything else or a quota of poor people. Uh, I think all of these things are just uh, hard to say, uh, condescending and uh, demeaning. Uh, I want everybody to have equal opportunity and then we'll select the best. Of course, Cambridge is one of the top universities in the world, so 90% of people are going to be rejected anyway, uh, but we want to select the 10% the best among everyone, not just among those who look like the ones who've been there uh, in the past uh, in the past decades. So um, I, I really resonate with what you say and I'm, and I'm happy that it came out of you instead of me first. Uh, how did you uh, cope with the fact that uh, the classes you were in, even before getting to university, were so male dominated? Did you have any episodes of bullying or, or anything you had to deal with? And how did you deal with that? Um, I think I was quite fortunate in the fact that everyone was very supportive. I was very well supported in what I was doing. Um, I think it was more the fact that it was just the scenario that I was in. Uh, my physics class was the same. Fortunately, my maths class was a little bit more mixed. Um, in terms of both gender and also just a wider variety of variation and diversity of people. Um, but I feel that in terms of things that I personally went through, I was quite fortunate. Everyone was very supportive. Everyone um, was very kind of, yeah, I guess supportive really. There wasn't necessarily that distinction between myself and the other classmates just because of my gender. Um, and my, yeah, my teachers were completely fine with it. It was more the kind of subtleties of the fact that it was just that scenario you could walk into a room and it's very evident that that is the gender balance that you're working with um i see it in, in companies and whatnot as well it's not necessarily an explicit thing it's much more subtle and implicit um in terms of a kind of kind of yeah i guess yeah subtle and implicit feeling of knowing that that is the case that you are in rather than at least in my experience, is something that kind of progressed in some kind of physical or abusive or kind of verbal form. All right. So coming to another aspect of this, um, um, maybe barriers to to get in to get into a place like Cambridge specifically. Uh, every everyone who comes to Cambridge, uh, myself included, you know, the first time you see, well, this is a place of super. Uh, brainy people, Nobel Prizes everywhere, and, and so on. Do I fit in? Will I fit in? Is it? Am I good enough for that kind of stuff? And and many people suffer from some 
form or other of imposter syndrome, uh, did you have to face any of that and how did you overcome it? Yeah, I think imposter syndrome is a really big thing in Cambridge, unfortunately. A lot of people suffer from it, regardless of what background they came from, whether that be state school educated, private educated, home educated, whatever. A lot of people feel it just because there is that kind of stigma and pressure that everyone here is a child genius. Everyone, for example, started programming before they could talk, all those kind of weird miscellaneous things. I think the main thing that I try and drive home is that there is a stereotype in Cambridge, um, but the main kind of I guess, quote unquote, Cambridge student is basically just anyone who's really passionate about their subject and wants to learn and is excited to learn. And that's pretty much it. There is so much variation diversity here. It's insane. There is so many great things going on. Um, and in terms of feeling imposter syndrome, I've personally found that it's really great to know that I'm not the only one feeling it. Um, my tutors and whatnot have been really supportive with that if I've had any issues and my college runs some kind of well-being sessions around dealing with imposter syndrome and helping others to do so as well. Um, I think the main thing is just to remember that you're here for a reason. Um, you got here for a reason. You, you know, you are on a propulsion to do well in your subject as long as you try hard and put the effort in and are keen to explore your subject. Um, but I think, yeah, the main thing is that there is support there for it. But there it is definitely a real thing that is an issue in Cambridge and something that I think a lot of people are still working to kind of relinquish and help students with because it is very much still a thing that a lot of people have to suffer with, unfortunately. Now, in terms of helping potential applicants believe that it's the thing for them, uh, I understand you've done something actively towards that. Do you have an initiative you're part of? Can you tell us something more about it? Yeah, so um, I'm very much into trying to increase the diversity and access in education. I do a lot of different things for that. Um, I tutor on a lot of um, voluntary tutoring platforms where students can get free help from Oxford students. Um, I'm also the um, vice president of the 93% club in Cambridge. Um, it's a very new initiative, but we're really excited to start working with companies to try and improve diversity. And one of my more recent things is that I'm the head of digital marketing and any kind of digital content things in general. Um, of a charity called UniReach. Um, so they're very primarily based in Oxford, but this year they're expanding into Cambridge. I'm actually their first Cambridge team member, which is really great to see that they're expanding into both universities. And they're also looking at other top universities such as Imperial. Um, and basically what we do is we offer free kind of on-demand tutoring for any student who might be potentially interested in applying to Oxford, so Cambridge and Oxford, anyone who needs help with admissions processes, CVs, anything like that. Basically, you just sign up on our website and we will match you with a Oxford student, hopefully if the same subject or the same interests. If they're available, we try and do our best. And pretty much it just helps the students with any kind of questions or queries they have, because I've personally found that it can be quite intimidating to see all of those big scary university websites and all the kind of information out there and just to be able to sit down with a student who has been there, who has gone through it and who is most of the time very down to earth about their experiences is a really great thing for students to have just so that they're aware of, yes, there is those kind of big scary stereotypes, but you talk to someone who is very friendly, kind, happy to talk about their subject, enthusiastic to learn, but also very kind of quote unquote normal they're not necessarily come across as a child genius. They are just a person that works hard and loves their subject. And I think getting that awareness that everyone is just so diverse and unique and just weirdly into their subjects is a really important thing to give out to applicants so that they aren't just scared off by stereotypes or stigmas because some of them are very prominent, unfortunately. We do need to try and tackle those to release their impact but it is a very ongoing process and one that won't necessarily be solved in the next like five, 10, however many years. It's one that will require a lot of kind of ongoing pressure and empowerment and working within colleges and across universities and also across wider schools to try and push out that impact that Cambridge and Oxford could be for you, regardless of what you look like, where you've come from, any kind of educational background, anything like that, I think is a really important thing that I am personally very passionate about kind of driving that force through. That, that's an excellent initiative. Was it started by other students like you or did it come with support from the university itself? How did it get started in the first place? Yeah, so UniReach is purely student run. Um, we are 
yeah, that's something we pride ourselves on. We're completely student run. Um, we work with some college JCRs. Um, as of recent, we've been really working on our YouTube channel. So we've been reaching out to college um, JCRs and trying to work out how we can help within those networks. But everything is very much from a student perspective. It's from students for students and will always be that way, um, which I think is really important because then we are in um, control and in power of what we put out to our students. Um, because obviously we want to be as transparent and open as we can be. And by not going through university network, we're very free to talk and discuss and do what we need to do, what we feel we need to do in order to help those students in a constructive way, rather than relying on necessarily any other funding or whatnot that might have ties to it. Um, we're very uh, open and honest about what we do um, and are just very keen to help other students like ourselves. And also the great thing about that is then that a lot of the students who get support from those organizations such as UniReach, Zero Gravity, um, the Oxford Launchpad, all of those great organizations are often very keen to then help other students once they secure their places. So it's a really great cycle and is a really great way to build up very long strange of students who are just really willing to help each other. That's great. Did, did, did you make use of this resource yourself to get into Cambridge? I didn't actually. I wish I knew they had existed, but I unfortunately just had no idea. Um, I very much got into the access work once I got into university rather than the other way around. But I do definitely feel I could have benefited really greatly from one of those services, even if it was just a half an hour chat with someone to check over my CV or talk about like stuff such as supplementary questionnaires or anything like that. Um, I think it would have been really helpful, but I personally didn't have that support, mainly because I personally didn't seek it out. I probably should have made more of an effort, but I certainly feel that there's a lot more of a prominent space for that kind of free access work. And we're very much trying to work with schools directly to make sure that students are just aware that that support is available. Yeah, if they so you need a bit of visibility at this stage more than anything else. Yeah. You have any feeling for how many of the uh, people who um, apply to this uh, uh, UniReach uh, are into computer science? Um, into computer science, we don't have exact numbers, I'm afraid, I'm not quite sure. Um, we kind of offer a broad range of subjects, basically anyone under the sun, um, but we recruit um, through kind of mentors and subjects and stuff. So we try and very much tailor the student to their mentor. So if they want to apply to computer science, the likelihood is we'll match them with a Cambridge or Oxford computer scientist. And if we don't have one available, just because of schedules or it's exam season or something, we'll try and match them with someone who does maths or engineering or something who has a little bit of experience in computer science. So we try and really tailor it as much as we can to the student's needs as much as possible. Obviously we are students, we have busy lives as well, um, but we, we really do try our best. That's very cool. While we are at it, we've been talking about the before getting into university before. Can you tell us something about your actual experience in Cambridge uh, uh, and what did you do in practice? What, what does one do after they get in uh, and what was most exciting about it and especially uh, as a woman? Yeah, um, so day to day, it's it's only quite different, obviously, because of the whole COVID situation. Our year has been very different to every other year. Hopefully it will improve, but we'll have to see. Um, but day -to -day, I hope next year will be different for all of you. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, day to day, it can be very varied. I think the nice thing about having stuff online this year has been that our schedules are a lot more flexible. Um, so people can do lectures as and when they want to do. So I've got some friends that prefer to watch them in the evenings when I've got some other early bird friends that will get up at silly hours in the morning to get them done, sorted and out of the way. Um, but I think that's a really great thing. Um, so in amongst lectures, we'll have kind of lab based stuff. Um, so we had some digital electronics practicals in the lab, luckily. Unfortunately, the kind of later ones were cancelled, but I at least enjoyed the first couple we had. Um, and if it's not working on kind of uni work or whatnot, um, there's always social stuff going on um, both in college and also in the wider university. Um, so I'm involved in a lot of um, college rowing, so I row and I cox for my college teams. It's very casual, it's it's not intense at all, um, it's very much just a kind of chilled way to meet new people. Um, I also, as I say, do some access work with 93% club and amongst that I also attend just little events such as um, there's a tea society, I'm a big tea drinker, um, so I attend those. And there's also a rambling club, which I go and join. So we just go on lots of little hikes around the countryside and just have a chat. Um, but there's lots of great things for that. In terms of the kind of more making sure that you feel comfortable in your own university space, um, there's a lot of wellbeing events also happen. Um, our college JCR has a great wellbeing program. Um, I know all the others have 
various wellbeing programs as well but see, i can't really speak for those but my own personal like college wellbeing service has been really great um in terms of just throwing little events like we've got a welfare picnic coming up where people just go along and have a chat um, and do stuff like that and as a department we've also got a woman in computer science society um, a highlight would be when they put lots of like sweets and chocolates in our pitches um, so like our pigeonholes, so kind of where we get our post um, in Michaelmas were our first term, just to kind of congratulate us and celebrate the year. And they do lots of great talks about empowerment and just generally women in computer science, not necessarily about kind of the access work they do, but just the really cool stuff and research that they do. There's always events like that happening, which is always really great if you're looking to improve your widening perspective on stuff like that. Um, and the department also puts on some really great stuff in terms of career prospects and whatnot. So there's always emails going out about internships and summer opportunities and whatnot. So there's also a lot of great things to be getting involved in there if you're wanting to focus on more the kind of education and career side of university life. So the, you are at a historical moment where something has happened, which is not at all normal, like, you know, <laughs> starting university during a war where well, fortunately it's not a war it's not as bad as a war but still you're you're one batch of students that came to Cambridge at the time when there was basically no uh, in-person interaction I've been confined at home for over a year now I've been told <laughs> stay at home don't come into the department and I all my my students who started at the same time as you I've only ever seen through video except before Covid when I admitted them <laughs> so, um, have you uh, but of course, not all terms have been the same. In in the uh, in the first term, there was some amount of lockdown. In the second term, very heavy lockdown. In this term, mm. things are starting to get a bit more relaxed as vaccines uh, have come out and so on. Have you met any of your um, fellow students and also any of the lecturers in person this year? Yeah. Um, so as a college, there's three of us. We're really close. I'm really fortunate there. Um, we've got a really great computer science kind of little cluster and we'll do events all the time. We'll hang out after supervisions and all that kind of stuff. In terms of wider kind of university, I've met some of the key students who are next door um, through the fact that we have some joint supervisions um, in terms of supervision um, kind of supervisors. They're not like done together, but we've been able to get to get know each other through that. Um, and also as a um, kind of a department we have a first year group chat um, where they'll often put on events such as um, getting ice cream or anything like that um, where they just give the students an opportunity to basically meet each other they're all student run we're pretty much just like hey does anyone want to grab ice cream um, so it's really great on that front um, that I have been able to meet a couple of people but nowhere near as many people as I would have liked anyone that I have met has basically been through those little meetups or from just messaging people on our group chats it has been a very much a shame that we haven't been able to talk to many other people um in terms of lecturers i've met only a couple when we went and did our digital electronics practicals in the lab in our first term but again we were sat at obviously very COVID secure desks um away from other people so we weren't necessarily given the opportunity to socialize and chat there um so in terms of meeting people i think it's definitely something i want to really pursue next year in terms of getting to know other students that do my subject because I feel that in college we've had a really great experience in terms of getting to know one another so I know a lot of different students across different subjects but I don't know that many across my I guess department um, so yeah it's certainly something that we really want to look at doing next year hopefully if restrictions allow that just allows us to meet a few more people yeah, yeah. I, I, I very much hope that the next year would be different for, for all of us and please do uh, take advantage of it because what is special about being at Cambridge is the other people like you uh, and you know the the teaching materials um, are the same for everybody uh, anywhere in the world anybody can buy the same textbooks that we recommend you guys uh, I, I put my lectures online anybody can look at them whether they are registered with Cambridge or not uh, the thing that really makes the difference is the being in the same class as all these other smart people uh, who have uh, a wide variety of backgrounds and interests and and are going to be your friends for life that that's the thing that makes it so i very much hope that you can at least from uh, october this year uh, start enjoying that which you fully deserve yeah hopefully um is there anyone who's been especially inspirational for you either at cambridge now or on the way to cambridge and on the way to deciding 
to do computer. You, you mentioned that at school there was this uh, uh, class that you took almost by chance was run by someone who seems to be very enthusiastic. Is this your uh, kind of mentor in that sense? Um, yeah, so my computer science teacher at GCC very much helped with my kind of progression to computer science. Yeah, I think he really understood um, what it was like to be a student and how to make learning exciting. So I think he certainly had a very big impact on the fact that I then pursued the subject um, in terms of my A-level experience. I didn't necessarily have what I would consider the best teachers in the world. Um, I very much supported myself through my studies um, just because the other members of the class were working at quite a different grade level than I was. So the classes were more tailored towards a different grade than I necessarily needed to get into the universities I was applying for. Um, but I think in terms of general aspiration, I don't necessarily draw from one person. I just quite enjoy looking at what is available within the kind of technology space at the moment, what research is going on. And I find that I just get inspired by little bits of research kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. I wouldn't say it's necessarily one person, um, but what I would say is that I attended a, hack like a Wikipedia, and I think it was like an edit-a-thon, what it was called, um, but it was hosted by um, someone in Cambridge, I believe. It was at the Cavendish Laboratory. This was, I think, a few years ago now, um, where basically a bunch of um, females who were looking to apply to the university got together and we edited um, and created Wikipedia articles for underrepresented people um, who have come from underrepresented communities that were doing really great stuff um, in the community for either technology or mathematics or engineering or anything that's very STEM related. Um, we basically just got together and edited and created articles as much as we could to improve that access. I think that was a really great thing to do um, because you can even see on Wikipedia that there is inequality there in terms of the amount of views and also the actual articles written um, in terms of who gets articles published and who doesn't, um, you can see some diversity issues there. So we were really looking to at least widen the access of that a little bit. Um, so yeah, I've definitely learned that sometimes it's great just to go looking for resources to have a little delve to see what you can find in amongst the kind of front page news, because um, sometimes you can find little articles which are really inspiring. That's super cool. Mm. So you've just finished your first year of the computer science tripus. Uh, never mind the things that were taught to you. Of the things you actually did yourself, what's the thing you enjoyed the most? Um, things I did myself. That is a really tough question, to be honest. I've really enjoyed a lot of things that I've done. Um, I think some of the 93% club events that I have gone to were probably some highlights. Um, so they'll host um, companies and corporations that will just talk about their progress in the industry in terms of access, what they're doing, how they can help, um, stuff like that. Some of those events have been really great. What, um, what does 93% refer to? Um, so it's the fact that there's um, the kind of, if you look at the cohort of students in the UK, 93% of those will be state school educated, um, but a very minor number of those will go on to securing the university places at places like Cambridge or Oxford. Um, so the whole idea is that we represent 93% of the students who come from state schools, I, that, like that section, sorry. Um, and the whole idea is just to inspire those students to try and defy that kind of typical state school um, statistic of those not getting into universities as frequently as necessarily people that are privately educated. Um, so we look to kind of work with schools and with corporations and stuff to open those doors and those opportunities to those that wouldn't necessarily have had them simply due to their financial means or the schools that they attended um, like earlier on in their education journey. And that's a resource that people who are still thinking of going to university could access as well. How do they do that? Yeah, so it's a um, kind of UK wide society as such for each um, each university that's participating has an individual society. So in Cambridge, we've got one 93% club Cambridge. Um, so we host kind of more Cambridge specific events, so ones that are tailored to this university or for those companies that are looking for that kind of research that Cambridge specializes in, so that kind of thing. Um, but in terms of getting access to those, there's plenty of Instagram pages, LinkedIn pages, websites, that kind of thing. Just type 93% club into any kind of browser and you'll be able to access all of those resources. I believe there's um, CV help on there and talks and all that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, if you're looking for kind of a wide overview, especially if you're not sure what university you want to attend necessarily, but are looking for some help, it's a really great resource. As a lot of the other access programs that I work for are very Oxbridge tailored specifically, but the 93% club is really broad 
um, in the fact that they offer a lot of different resources for a lot of different universities. That's really fascinating and really in line with what I'm trying to do with this series of videos to encourage uh, people who maybe not don't, wouldn't think they fit actually, so long as you like the stuff and you're smart, you do fit. You just forget about all the things that have been drilled into your brain incorrectly. Uh, so in, in closing, what I'd like to ask you is, um, if you, a few years ago, had had the luxury of speaking with someone like Gemma, who's just finished the first year at Cambridge, what would you have liked to ask her? Um, I think I probably would have asked a lot of the kind of questions that a lot of my mentors ask, um, will I fit in? What's the community like? Stuff like that. Um, and I think they are very important questions to cover in terms of will there be support in place for those kind of things? Um, the answer is yes, there absolutely will be. Um, they are addressed, they are aware of, they are things that we are working on. Um, and I think in terms of subject, I would just ask, personally, I found that I was struggling with working out whether I wanted to pursue a very broad degree, um, such as the Cambridge Tripos, where we study a lot of different things in amongst our subject, or whether I wanted to be more specific and go purely down a programming route um, and take a degree which was very software engineering based. Um, and I think that that was definitely a decision I really struggled with when I was looking at universities and deciding on what courses I wanted to go to. Um, yeah, and my advice would be if you have any kind of doubt about what you want to do, it may be more suited to at least consider broader courses, because I personally found that courses that I, again, really hadn't considered were then things that I really enjoyed the most out of my year. Like those subjects that I thought I would enjoy, I did enjoy, but they weren't necessarily my standouts in amongst my other educational means this year. So I think at least having that awareness that your subject is not one narrow pipeline, it's very much a broad field which interacts with most likely a lot of other different fields, such as for computer science, it's stuff like psychology and mathematics, there's engineering, a lot of medicine comes into play nowadays as a lot of medical equipment becomes very technology based. Um, so I feel that it's something you definitely should look into in terms of working out if the thing you think you want to do is necessarily for you um, and just be aware to adapt and change and to think about other careers um, as you go through your degree or your education further down, GCSEs, A-levels, whatever. Just yeah, have a, bro a broad open mind would be my main advice. That's excellent. Any parting words of wisdom? Um, yeah, um, let me have a think. Yeah, I think my main advice is yeah open mind, um, don't be afraid to try, um, don't be afraid to ask for help as well, if you need help, ask for it, otherwise you might not get it, I think I've definitely learned that this year, I've asked so many questions to my supervisors and have come away a lot better off than I would have if I just sat in those meetings without talking, um, but yeah, just enjoy your subject basically, um, and if you enjoy your subject and are passionate about it, then definitely consider looking at universities or applying, maybe Cambridge, maybe Oxford, depending on what you'd prefer. Um, and just, yeah, consider those things, explore your subjects and just have a good time with it, basically.